Um, already um, have you that James Boyce has joined us today. James Boyce is um, the creative director, is that what the title comes to? Oh, and sorry. founder, oh, yeah. Founder. It's, <laughs> it's right on the <laughs> screen. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so a very brief introduction, but because uh, I think it's better if, if James kind of explains more about what they do, but um, they are an interesting creative group of individuals and they're based in Sydney and they do all kinds of wonderful projects. I think it's hard to kind of pin down exactly kind of what those projects are because I think at the heart of it they're probably just they're um, very creative storytellers. Um, as in conversations with James as we were preparing for this, we were kind of discussing what, what he could talk about today and what we've kind of come to is this point where talking about why the, the why of the project, the the process of the project is just as important to Grumpy Sailor as, as the outcome. So they're quite agnostic to the method of delivery. Um, so I'll let, I'll hand over to James to kind of explain more about, um, about Grumpy Sailor. Oops, we've lost. Yeah. I kicked it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was good. I like it. It's a good start. We've lost the oh, I think your laptop just went to sleep. There we go. <laughs> okay. It'll be all right. We can get through this. Oh. Okay, there we go. All right. Without further ado, let's introduce James Boyce. <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, thanks for having me down here today. Um, uh, I think I probably need to preface this with saying that I'm not an academic. Um, so what you'll see today is, is, is not an academic talk or anything. It's really just kind of uh, some thoughts down on paper. Um, I come from a company called Grumpy Sailor. We're based out of Sydney. Uh, and we are a multidisciplinary team uh, of uh, makers of things. Uh, designers, developers, producers, project managers, all sorts of kind of weird and wonderful people. Um, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, I'd describe us as a creative technology team. Um, uh, that's my things. I thought I'd structure this like a q and A. I I was watching Q&A the other day. Um, and so I thought, I used to be an actor. Um, and whenever I was uh, auditioning for plays, I always thought I could play all of the roles. So tonight, I'm going to play Tony Jones. I'm also going to play all of the audience. And I'm going uh, uh, to play all the panel. So I'm Pauline and Bob Catter and everybody all rolled into one. So who are Grumpy Sailor? So I've given you a brief sort of hint. Um, we're not that grumpy. Uh, I have already answered that question, so I'm going to just move on. That's who we are as a team. Um, I guess pretty young, uh, pretty crazy bunch of people. Um, that's at our um, yearly grumpathalon, where there's feats of brain and brawn, and we compete for the Kraken Cup, which you can see in the bottom of the um, Kraken is our rum of choice as sailors. So what do we do? Well, we do everything really, except for print, um, but sometimes we do print. Um, I guess uh, the best way to describe us is that we're platform agnostic um, when it comes to um, uh, working on our projects. Our projects range and vary across a whole bunch of different um, commercial applications. Um, we work a lot in the cultural sector, um, and um, I guess occasionally we do print because we do what the project requires us to do. Um, uh, and that uh, primarily we're designers and storytellers. And um, yeah, this is the Grumpy Sailor sweet spot. Um, so we take design and we take technology and we take story and that's where we tend to play. So most of our projects, if not all of our projects, need to have 
a combination of the three of these. Um, the business is changing and has changed. We're six years old now. Um, and uh, it's really starting to split into three different companies. Um, and the first one being uh, our work for hire, uh, which is uh, primarily in the cultural sector and, um, and with blue chip um, commercial partners who we do um, external R&D for, but also kind of use technology to tell stories in interesting ways. Uh, we build exhibits, we do a whole bunch of weird stuff. So that's our main business. But it's, uh, it's also starting to change and shift. So we're sort of taking on a whole bunch of new work um, um, in two other fields. One is in product development. Um, and uh, and we've, that's been going for about six months now. Um, and then uh, another side of the business which is around long form um, storytelling. So things like uh, feature films and, um, and TV series and whatnot. So, and that's probably about a year old. So it's changing. What if I still don't know what you do? Well, that's a really good question, guys. Thanks for asking that, audience. Um, <laughs> here you go. Uh, this will hopefully, it's, it's actually not going to give you any more uh, context than I've given you already. So have a look. No, no um, further context required, right? <laughs> um, come on now. Yeah. So what do you think about when you think about digital? Um, it was written twice, uh, just for uh, punctuation. Uh, we think about the rainbow cat, but we also think about this. Um, does everyone know about the gut? I guess um, the reason that I bring this up is we play uh, with bleeding edge technologies, or at least we say that we do. I'm sure you guys play with much more sophisticated technologies than we do. But what we kind of tend to do is um, we try to catch them on the way up, and we try to find ways in which we can uh, experiment with them uh, before they kind of hit this sort of plateau of productivity. I've always loved these, the, the, the names of the various parts of this chart. Um, uh, the trough of disillusionment. Um, uh, you can sort of certainly see augmented reality playing right there, right now. Um, but um, yeah, essentially, um, when we think about technology, we don't think about it as, as the thing. Um, it, it, it isn't the thing for us. What it is, is it, it's, a, it's a toolkit that allows us to explore um, different ways of communicating with humans. We look at tech as uh, technology as uh, something that should enhance human interaction, not be at the expense of human interaction. So all of our projects that tend to kind of fall into this, to this space where we're using technology as a toolkit. And often we try to put it, um, get it out of the, um, that for the user, and, and we are very much user first, we, we, we tend to try to create projects where the technology is kind of hidden um, and that it's not seen. Um, because we can. So how do we do it? So we do it 
this is the really broad brushstrokes that I'm giving you right now. So uh, these are the kind of four areas that we kind of explore when we, uh, um, that, uh, that help us deliver a project. So we do the creative development. So the work that I just showed you in that video is just the work that we did last year. So um, we're only a team of 20 people, but we are prolific um, in the amount of work that we're able to output. That doesn't mean that we work on every facet of a project. In fact, we'll often contract people on. Um, but we generally do the rapid prototyping ourselves. Um, uh, as you can see, we've kind of our storytelling chops are improving every day, and um, and production is where we pull in contractors to actually help us deliver on the work. Um, there's no point in us having a um, Mechtronic engineer on staff. It just doesn't make sense from a, a financial perspective. And we're really kind of we're we're about commercial creativity. So we're we're really about trying to find the uh, fastest and most effective way to deliver a, an experience to a user. Can you look under the hood? Great question again. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, sure, I'll show you this. This is the grumpy sailor process. There is a health warning. Uh, we understand that this may be on the complex side of complex. Please review in the company of a grump. This is a combination of a whole bunch of different uh, design methodologies um, and agile uh, uh, um, project development um, processes. But this is generally kind of, I just kind of wanted to show you that it's, it, it, whilst I'm making it quite simplistic, there is a whole bunch of processes. So what we, what we sell as a group is not the output. In fact, uh, I everybody that you ask would tell you that it's a fucking stupid idea to build an entire business around bespoke technology. It is, doesn't make any sense, right? But we've managed to build a business that is sustainable and that is growing all the time uh, because um, what we sell is not our output. What we sell is the process by which we get to the end result. And so it doesn't really matter what we're working on, we're going to get there. So we have, that's just kind of one insight into kind of the, the, the level of process that we use to get to where it is that we get to. What's in a name? That's Shakespeare. I've managed to get Shakespeare into our, uh, um, what is it in a name? This is the Grumpy Sailor. Uh, people always ask about it. Um, now the Grumpy Sailor, um, the reason I'm bringing that up as a question is because it's kind of, um, it is quite pertinent to, the, to what I'm trying to tell you today. So uh, the Grumpy Sailor was a, a toy uh, or, a, or a wooden carved statue that I used to play with as a little kid. Um, it was very tactile. Uh, I really loved uh, the feel of it. Um, and uh, I guess at Grumpy Sailor, what the, the, the little mantra that we have around Grumpy Sailor is that if you can create something that people will feel, you'll create something that they remember. And so that's kind of the, the, what we always fall back on is, is are we creating something that uh, people will remember? And I think only now are we starting to get to the point where you know, with some of our more recent work, um, I think the, uh, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party was in there. It is a very memorable experience um, because the technology is out of the way, um, it's story-based, and um, it's unforgettable, right? It, it is just, it's kind of stirring. Um, do I have any photos? Of course I have photos. Who doesn't have photos these days? This is uh, a project, uh, Google Pixel Wall. Um, this is a 12,800 LED uh, uh, lights that we turned into push buttons, um, and there's a whole bunch of games that you can play. Um, it kind of launched into uh, two Telstra st flagship straws. Uh, this is Teddy X. Uh, this was a teddy bear that spoke to you as you walked around the Sydney Opera House. Um, this is the, uh, I think you might have seen this project, Paul Abray, who's one of our uh, great collaborators, who's just a bloody legend as well. Um, uh, she, she commissioned our first project with the State Library, which was to explore their, uh, their archive and throw away uh, this idea of the little white box. So how do you meander through a, li a library like you used to? Um, and, and one of my favourite projects still, a couple of years on, Music Vault. So we designed and developed the, 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 the execution that is um, uh, underneath the uh, Performing Arts Centre. If you haven't seen it, it's a pretty cool exhibit. But, but what I love about this project is, is not where it is now, but where it's going to be in the next three years and beyond, um, because we built a canvas and the canvas is updatable. And to actually do that with a space, it's not been done that much. Um, uh, yes, we talk about screens being updatable, but this is not a screen. There are screens involved, but the, the whole space is augmentable and it's updatable over time because one of the things about music is that music's constantly changing and evolving, right? So how do you stick with the times and how do you create something that can be updated? This is uh, an interesting project called The Oracles uh, that we did with Punch Drunk and Google's Creative Lab. Um, and it was a, uh, it was a, um, 
a project based in the UK where uh, kids were able to jump uh, from a game that they were playing in class and, uh, and create a space where they were able to um, explore a, a physical version of that game. What we built for them was um, uh, a lantern uh, that uh, knew who you were, knew where you were, and knew what you were touching. So it was a, con a, a, a combination of a few different technologies, uh, including capacitive touch and um, UWB for indoor, indoor spatial tracking. Um, and uh, it unlocked uh, that the depending on what you were touching and what you'd seen before you got there, um, different parts of the play or the experience would, would open up depending on kind of what you'd done previously. Um, uh, that's an old one, but a nice picture. Uh, this is Wonderland. Uh, this is Acme, um, the project in the city at the moment. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we we sort of helped to to uh, develop the, the the entire exhibit. And, and then when they were carving off the things to be procured, um, this was the jewel. And the, for us, um, it was the most complex thing that they you could build there. And so we kind of threw our hat in the ring for this, and we were lucky enough to be able to help bring it to life. Um, and this is a cube. This is a, uh, a project we did with the Creative Lab up in Sydney uh, with Google's Creative Lab. Um, I think T's spoken to you guys as well. Um, so this is a project coming from a couple of years back that I just still love um, because it hides the technology. Um, and I don't know whether T is still talking about this project. She's got so many amazing projects. But um, you pick up a, a, a cork cube um, and it, uh, it uh, manipulates a six-sided cube on screen that has video playing on all six sides and it pans and zooms and uh, depending on what and uh, it's a really uh, awkward way of watching a film <laughs> but it, I think the hypothesis is quite interesting is that uh, uh, you know it's that kind of it's that next level of um, choose your own adventure um, but the thing is that it's just a phone hidden in a cork piece of cork and uh, <laughs> people don't even realize it so why do we do this well the short answer is because we can um, and we're lucky enough to be able to. But seriously, why? I knew you guys had asked that straight away. So uh, I prepared a, a slide about invisibilia. Does anyone listen to invisibilia? So there's a recent, yeah, everybody, okay, cool. So does everyone know the episode um, where they were talking about um, the power of poetics? Um, so there was a, uh, an episode uh, of invisibilia, which is one of my favorite podcasts, which talks about um, um, the, uh, the world in which uh, facts and logic and argument um, and uh, that they've become less significant in terms of changing hearts and minds um, and that if you're actually wanting to change hearts and minds what we should be considering is the power of poetics and I really um, it, that's something that really rings true for me and rings true for our team is that uh, people don't buy what you do people buy why you do it there's a fantastic uh, uh, um, I've just quoted somebody, and I can't remember who I'm quoting. Sendak? Um, Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek. There you go. I just want to quote him properly. But, but essentially, uh, they don't buy the, the, the technology. They don't buy the argument. They don't buy the logic. What they buy is the story that you create around that. Um, so if you really wanted to kind of change hearts and minds, that's where you have to play. Um, and um, I think it's, it, it really takes people on an emotional journey. Um, and if we're going to create things that people will remember, you have to hit them in the emotional sort of cortex. That's not a thing. So uh, can you give us a test to make sure we've got it? Sure, I can give you a test. What do all these things have in common? That's right, they're all stories, right? Like, so basically, that's the thing that they have in common. They all have different uh, delivery mechanisms as well. And I think that's really important that it's not about the delivery mechanism that makes these things powerful. In fact, you could probably take these stories and put them into a different delivery mechanism and they'd still be powerful um, and they'd still resonate with audiences. So what are we interested in exploring? Of course, there's things that we're interested in exploring. So we're explore interested at the moment in exploring artworks that respond to audiences while the audience is responding to the artwork. We're interested in cultural and community spaces that are technologically modular, surprising and delightful. We're interested in indoor spatial tracking that results in rooms that come alive, depending on where you are and what you're looking at. Uh, we're interested in screenless digital experiences. Say no to crack. We're interested in smarter, healthier, more sustainable sensing cities. You know, I'd love to be able to play in that space. Uh, we're interested in redesigning democratic and civil organisational structures for the technological age, because we should. Uh, it's about time, if last week was anything to go by. 
Uh, and we're interested in designing communal technology experiences that draw people together, not pull them apart. But most of all, more than any of that, we're interested in good old-fashioned human stories delivered in unique ways. And that's what we see the power of technology being. So I love story, so you love story. Do you hate tech? Well, that's an interesting question as well, and thanks for asking it. Um, no, I love it. I love tech. I don't love it as much as this guy. Um, but I think it's actually important to look at a couple of takeaways that I thought that might be, might be interesting. I think what I'm trying to say is that if we're innovating without any idea of kind of how this is going to connect to the user, if we're creating pieces of technology that hasn't got um, at least um, their best interests at heart at the end of it, then we're really not going to be creating anything that has any resonance. We believe at Grumps that in order to do that, you need to be able to engage them at an emotional or a poetic level. Um, people can and do and still always will lean into stories, whether it's around a campfire, whether it's all of us standing here today, you listening to me, whether it's a, a, a feature film on at the local cinema. We're, storytelling is important. It has value and it changes hearts and minds. I think tech and innovation becomes an important support for this emotional aim. And we always say, can, um, we will continue to explore technology, we'll continue to experiment and prototype with technology, but we won't make technology our master. Um, because it, there is, um, for us, that's not what is most important. Um, it might be for others, but for us it's about uh, creating accessible stories uh, in new and unique ways. Um, and that's kind of sort of where things land. Thanks. And now, do you have actually any questions? It was 20 minutes, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, good. I, I might have gone over a little bit. Um, but yeah, sorry. I've, I've asked all the questions, so you probably don't have any. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything you kind of want to know more about? Or, yeah. yeah. Well, especially with the emphasis on stories, I'm curious on to what extent your group um, uh, gets this in where the impetus for the stories come from. If it's like a client comes to you saying, ha, us find the story and your job is to sort of unearth what the story is or if they say here is our vision can you help us explore how to communicate it uh, yeah it's different it's different mm -hmm. so just as every project is different we have um, the way things get briefed in is different mm -hmm. some people are more interested in uh, a technology solution mm -hmm. to a problem um, and other people are more interested in in story I think it's um, I guess uh, there's a um, Robert Wong who we worked with over at, uh, um, within the Creative Lab at Google. Uh, he's based in New York, but he has a great talk that he gives on the science and the fiction, and that science and, and fiction is actually it's the it's the it's actually the um, relationship between the two that is most important. So he talks about um, the Star Trek communicator. Um, um, was actually conceived of in fiction before it became something that we carry around in our pockets every day. Um, but uh, it's inspired um, one or the other, and, and that it goes both ways, um, and that the technology can also inspire story. So I guess, um, sort of coming back to your question, you know, how do things get briefed in? I think it's um, you have to be flexible, and you have to kind of understand kind of when you're getting a brief, what it is that they're asking for. Um, but neither is, is, is more important. We have a sort of, the, the, um, when we're actually doing uh, prototyping, it's not until we actually plug a story in uh, that we'll actually work out whether it's got value or not. Because, um, you, you know, if you're too close to that technology canvas, um, there's a great, um, the, the, the too close to the canvas thing is actually a, it's, a, it's a, um, an anecdote that is often used in painting because um, uh, when you're actually up against the canvas, um, you don't have the perspective, right? Um, and uh, you're not seeing the whole picture or the whole story, right? Uh, and you can be working away at this sort of uh, uh, little part. And that's whether you, if you've actually watched a painter paint, they'll hold if they're if they've got good if they've been trained properly, they'll um, they'll take a step forward and they'll do a little paint. Have you ever seen that? And they sort of take a step back and then they take another. But that's, the, that's actually the way people paint, and it's a you, unique room to kind of come back and forth. Um, and that's really, I think, about giving yourself the full context um, and allowing kind of things, one thing to push the other. 
And I, I think that that's actually the relationship between story and, and technology as well, is that they kind of, you've got to keep checking back. Mm-hmm. If you're not checking back, you're not going to know. Um, um, and with us, um, the biggest challenge is often things like schedule and budget, right? Uh, we can't keep going on forever and we can't keep, we've got a delivery date. Um, we had a delivery of a massive project in, at the Melbourne Museum yesterday. So you have to kind of prioritise things um, and you don't know what to prioritise unless you're testing, unless you're getting a user in there to, and they can't test it unless you kind of give them a story to test. So long, long answer to a pretty small question, sorry. I, I waffle. <laughs> Is there any other questions that? So the question is really around. Um, yeah, about like the business model. So how could be sustainable and also as well as innovative and experimental? Um, it's a. It, it is a. a we're. Um, we're in a service industry. That's well. Service. That's what we are. Oh. Um, so we we uh, that that's pretty different to our product. Um, um, and and uh, and then it, that's very different to our content. Um, as well, because the, the the three have completely different business models, and it's really hard to get your head around. Um, one one is about uh, they say in, uh, in Hollywood that uh, you should never um, you never should never get high on your own supply, so you should never fund your own projects essentially. So what what, you, what they're saying is that you've got to convince somebody else to pay for it, mm-hmm. and if you can't convince somebody else to pay for it, then you shouldn't be doing it. So that's film, right? Product is completely different again because the business models around that are around market validation, finding out whether a user might possibly be interested in this piece of technology that you're building or this this, this story that you're trying to, to tell. Um, so the business model there is really about um, establishing a um, uh, something that investors are interested in or bootstrapping it until you can find get it to a customer. Right, and the customer pays it. With the work for hire stuff, yeah, like you said, it's it's probably more difficult for you as a, a, a as as somebody who's operating in an Australian market uh, around things like government tenders and but it, uh, and uh, and grants and um, but there's a whole bunch of commercial companies. I the business that we are in today is very different to the business that we started. Um, you can't go straight to the business that we are today without doing what we did when we started. And so I think I often say that we were, this is probably sort of divulging too much, but I think that um, when we first started, the, 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 the company that we were was um, one that said yes to everything. Um, and I often get the question, is like, how do I get to do what you do? Well, the, the way that you get to do what we do is by saying no to things, it's not by saying yes to things. So uh, actually kind of going after the things that you think are valuable. But when you're getting a business started, particularly in the service industries, you kind of have to take what you can you can get so, you know, and, and, and turn that into the opportunity that you want it to be. Um, and so, yeah, th- there, are, there are pockets of money everywhere to continue to build and develop. You've just got to know the right way of discussing it with people or, and um, like uh, a lot of the projects there um, are initiated by us. People come to us and say we want to do something, um, we've got this amount of money, we've got this idea um, and then it's a collaborative process to bring it to light. So that's kind of, does that explain it? I, I, mean, I, I guess I'm, yeah, it's, uh, you got to do the hard, you got to do the hard yards though, like if you're starting a business, it's, it's just, You've got to do it. You've got to always be making stuff. Um, that's the only thing I can. So how long is it? How long is it? Two years. 
to get to this point? Yeah, yeah. It, de it depends. As an individual, probably, um, I have a very speckled past. Like mm -hmm. I, um, I, uh, I worked in feature. I, I, I always say that I started in feature film and I've worked my way down smaller and smaller screens. <laughs> um, uh, but my first job was um, cleaning dishes on uh, uh, on King Kong over in New Zealand. That was, and so I worked at Weta. I got a job for a maid and just hauled ass for years and but learnt what technology this is what I loved about working at Weta is I saw I was privy to the first motion capture studio at a commercial in a commercial environment that is like wow technology is a is a powerful and and and, and very um, valid uh, way to create art um, but I think you know my my own personal journey it wasn't until Claire and I, my business partner, um, got together as a as a as a creative team, um, and then that's when the business changed completely. That was probably about five years ago. I ran it by myself for about uh, a year before that, but yeah, so six years really. Um, but I've been making stuff my whole life. Um, yeah, some of it much better than other. <laughs> should, I, I try to hide, like, this would be a completely different story if I showed you my original work, um, which would probably be an interesting talk, though. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, uh, so I guess it's kind of two parts. Um, so uh, you see that you're story focused, not technology focused. Um, so I guess part one of the questions is uh, how, you, how you pick a technology for a story then, and like how you find new technologies. Um, and then uh, the second part is, though your focus is kind of story driven, presumably people come to you and are like, we want to do something with, you know, hot trend X, and then you've got to try and kind of backpedal. How do you, how do you balance that as a creative technology company as well? Um, okay, so the, 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 the first question. How do you match um, technology and how do you yeah. kind of stay abreast of cool new things? Okay, so. Um, the, the way that we approach that, that question, that initial question, is it's whatever the story calls for, right? So, um, War and Peace doesn't necessarily lend itself to a podcast. Um, uh, you kind of go, well, it's actually, it's in the form that it should be. Um, and people have tried to turn it into a film. It doesn't work, right? So you've got to sort of take the lead, I think, from the story that you're trying to tell. But that's, that's kind of, um, that's my particular take. There are people at Grumpy Sailor um, <laughs> who disagree with me completely. Like, and, and it's generally the people that are in, the, in our technology team in terms of what comes first. But what we all agree on is that the, the, the North Star is to create something that people will remember. We all recognize that the value that story has in it and for us, what technology brings to it as well. So there's no hard and fast rules, there's no formula. Um, I guess let the, let the story tell us what it is that, and, and it's, design is also the other part of what we do, right? So design is a very, you know, when you're designing, uh, in order to design a solution, what do you need? A good problem. It's completely different to how do you write a story and how do you define, how do you, how, how do you explore technology right so it, it really is the mix of those three right so often it is um, often we don't get somebody saying do you want to do a story uh, or we want to do a story or we want to explore a technology normally it's we've got a problem and we need to solve it right and so then we kind of work backwards from there like they like it's a Venn diagram for a reason is everything has equal weighting your second question I don't know. Oh, no, that's kind of answered that as well. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not getting a lot of sleep at the moment. I've got three kids under five, so my brain doesn't uh, doesn't remember things quite as well as it used to. Um, Brilliant, yeah. Like, I think the form follows narrative thing is, is really relevant to what you just said. And I thought your metaphor for the artist engaging with the canvas and how, in a sense, different that is to the way that we in a sense, have been working kind of with a, a computer yeah. um, is, is, again, you know, really sort of important, um, I guess, kind of sounding board for what that relationship is. Yeah. Um, 
on, it makes me sort of think about the relationship between the creative industries and the cultural industries. And, and you've done a lot of work that kind of moves, in a sense, between those two. Yep. Um, I'm wondering what kind of benefit you know, you've experienced by engaging with you know, museums and galleries and cultural institutions um, through the, the kind of the design and the kind of creative technology you know, work as well. So that creative industries sort of cultural sector kind of dynamic is that's mm. what, what benefits um, have you experienced out of that? Um, I think the I think the cultural sector, um, and this is a very broad statement that I'm about to make, is uh, is going through a renaissance, um, and it's going through a renaissance because the competition has heated up around. Um, they're not competing with. Um, well, it depends on the cultural sector that you're talking about, but they're not necessarily competing with Netflix, right? Which is everybody always says, well, why would I go out when I can just sit down and. People still want to go out. People still want to go out and experience something. They want to learn something. They want to kind of want to take their kids somewhere. They want to get the kids out of the house. I, I know that one for sure. Um, but the, the the renaissance is, I think, that's happening is that um, the competition has heated up for that um, at a commercial level for that share of mind, right? So in order for that to happen, um, um, I feel like they're they're probably some of the bravest. Uh, makers of things because they've realized that and 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 so so the cultural sector have realized what have we got that nobody else has we have incredible collections we have incredible spaces we have access to government funding we have uh we have a a, a membership uh um, database um and what can we do with all of that how can we how can we make sure that that we're um we're doing something that's valuable or that we're telling stories that are meaningful um, it's really important that those those um, those people that tell our collective stories are given the opportunity to tell them. So people look at that, and they go, like, who are in a commercial sector, and they say, "God, I'd love to have all of those things," um, because um, working on those projects, um, those projects have gravitas; they have meaning. You know, when you're trying to sell a Mars bar, it's a completely different story. But what I've seen more than anything is that they're borrowing from one another, and that um, that uh, you know we've we've done a bit of work around um, uh, around digital uh, advertising, and the thing that blows me away about digital advertising, you know, that that it is uh, so nuanced, the amount of people that that um, that click through, and that uh, that there is. It's a, it's a numbers game, right? And it's really, at a, we're talking about very small um, um, take up uh, of these projects. So they're kind of going, well, you know, um, companies go, well, that's part of our strategy to sell more product or to sell more experience, but it's not all of it. And, and how do we, and, and so what we're seeing, I think, currently is, is a rise in experiential um, and we're seeing a, a, a sort of uh, an apathy towards um, some of those more what are now traditional media's uh, for delivering ads. So I think they can. Um, it's it's where they come together, which I think is the really because um, they can come together and it can be wrong, and it can and it can really hurt both sides. But they can also come together. I think if if a if a if a commercial partner is going to come and, and work with a, a cultural organisation, I think uh, uh, you know that traditional mono, uh, that the traditional relationship with benefactor or supporter or sponsor is a very safe one and a very good one. And leave the stories to the people that know how to tell those stories um, and and and, and uh, enjoy the brand association rather than trying to drive it. It sometimes works. Um, I, it's a, the exception, not the rule, though. Well, you'd be aware of how, like, you know, a lot of sort of museums—not a lot, but you know—many museums are introducing kind of experience designers, actual kind of experience um, design, mm. kind of you know, curatorial um, approaches as well. Like, do you feel feel that's a necessary um, ingredient in that 
that mix? Because that's not part of the traditional way that museums would sort of see their design departments or that the separation of the design There's department a big from curatorial education access. Yes. Yeah. Experience design can kind of sit in the, the middle of all of that. Like, is, is that a, um, from your experience of working with places like Acme or, or the like, how, how important is I that? I don't think it's um, sitting in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an important spoke in the wheel. And I think that uh, that is the, probably the big shift. Um, and that technology is not considered, or that the, uh, the digital experience makers are not considered last. Okay, well, now that, we've, now that we know what we want to do, we're going to go and talk to the digital experience creators or the um, experience designers. That's not happening anymore. The people, um, I think the, the big shift has been around curators actually making a little bit of room. Because curation is a, is a collection first um, uh, methodology, right? Whereas experience design is what? user first, right? So it's it's really about kind of saying they're actually both important and, and one is not more important than the other and that's the big shift that we're seeing. So a lot of um, our cultural um, collaborators, uh, collaborators in the cultural sector are tending to take on, um, I guess, uh, a, a bit of a shift in the way that they, they're, they're trying new things. Um, and they're doing that not because they could or they should or somebody's telling them to, it's because that's what audiences are demanding. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know when, you can, when you can sit at home and put on a VR headset and take yourself to another world and it's super immersive, well, you've got to be able to kind of do, like if you go into the AMV, the, the music bowl, you can't experience that at home. And that's, that's, that is the bar that is set now, is that, and so everybody knows that if you're gonna build anything that's gonna get any traction and get any kind of foot traffic, that you've actually gotta kind of go even further and harder to create something that can't be experienced anything anywhere else. Um, but yeah, um, I guess they're on the record now, those things that I'm saying, but I don't know. Like, there are definitely people that would disagree with me and, I'm, I, these are just my, my thoughts on it. Um, yeah. Is there any other questions? I'm going to test your sleep deprivation. The, um, I was wondering what the, I feel like I both heard you talk about the, like the actual grumpy say around the feeling, emotion piece being what sort of drives her to be memorable. And so maybe that is the answer. Um, but when you were talking about like your Venn diagram at the beginning or the, uh, the idea that it seemed like you were sort of discussing that like with the methodology that you know it's, it's not the platform or the canvas or the, so in a way it feels like it isn't the design or the technology or the story itself, like they're all means to an end. So I'm, I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more end might be, like what well, you see a kind of thematic in that, because when I think of that Simon Sinek thing, that's what made me start thinking about it, is, is like why you do sort it. of is the what and the how, right, and that the why is really what's important, which you sort of wrapped up as storytelling, but I feel like in a way the story is the one of the hows, so I'm kind of wondering what, to what, like what's the why of the telling the stories, and is there anything that is consistent, or is it really dependent on who's coming to you and their why? I think it's um, it's changed. So um, Shunji, um, who's our uh, exec producer at Grumps, um, so Claire, my business partner, who I always tend to have these kind of conversations with, has gone on mat leave, right? And so I'm I'm running the ship uh, by myself at the moment. And Shunji and I had had lunch together, and he was like, he just got really niggly one day, uh, <laughs> just just to sort of it was poking the bear. And he was just like, he just, but why, but why, but why? And it was, you know when a kid sits in the back of the car and it's just like, but why, but why, but why? And you end up, and it always ends up being, well, because that's the way that the universe works, right? I think, um, uh, you know, when you extrapolate right out, I think um, the why is different for everyone. There's a, there's a really, um, um, there's a, uh, you know, I, I actually have never read one of her books, but um, she's a pretty powerful speaker, um, and, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, and she wrote Eat, Pray, Love. 
Um, she sent out this thing the other day, which was, uh, not the other day, I always do that, uh, <laughs> who knows when, um, but it was, um, it was, it was a, a talk that she gave on um, why we do what we do, mm. right? And then that there are, if we break our lives down into four sort of factors that are, that are probably the most important to, to consider, um, one is hobbies, one is job, one is career, and one is vocation. Now your hobby can change over time, this is what she argues, right? Mm -hmm. Your hobby can change constantly and, and, and you can pick it up, you can do it for five minutes, you can do it for five years. It's, you can do it for your whole life, but it won't be, it's sort of not why you get up in the morning, right? But it's, it makes life rich and enjoyable. The second uh, is uh, a job, right? And this is what you do to pay the bills. And your job, if you're lucky, lines up with your career. And your career is a, is a, is a, is a north star. It's where you want to be headed. Vocation, she said, is a thing that the people don't really talk about very often. And it is really, it's what you can't do. Um, that you, oh sorry, that you can't, it's not what you can't do. It's definitely what you can do, but it's what you can't not do. So like, it's so, it's your calling, right? It's, it's, it's part of what drives you. And I think it's different for everyone. So when I say, um, there are, there are going to be, um, we're a very egalitarian team, a very flat structure at Grumps. Every person at Grumps gets something different out of what Grumps is. And we're very particular about who we let through the door. Like, there's, it's only a small amount of people outputting a lot. Like I mentioned, it's prolific. Mm -hmm. But it's because everybody who's in there is doing, they understand their why. They understand why they come to work every day. We have no problem with people sitting around, sitting on Facebook and wasting time mm -hmm. procrastinating. Our, um, we use every minute of everyone's day at work is accounted for. And there are times when we sort of socialise and, 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 and chill, but we're all working towards our own North Stars as well as the collective one. So long story short, it's different for everybody. For me, it's story. For Grumpy Sailor, I think the reason I do it is because I see I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a bleeding heart. I'm quite an empathetic person and I see the world going to hell in a handbasket because of technology, not um, for it. Like, it, it, it upsets me when I walk down the street and I see families all on their phones together. I think, it's, I think we've got it wrong. I don't think we've got it right yet. And I think, like, um, my, my, um, often when I, when, when I go visit people who are in the baby boomer generation, you walk into their house, you're having a conversation with them and the TV's still going. And I'm like, that generation hasn't learnt how to use that technology effectively, whereas I look at my generation, the TV only goes on if you've got something specific to watch. It's not like a, a thing that you, like it's a, um, you sit down and then you decide and, and you've created space to do that. So I think it's a generational thing. I think um, I, it upsets me. I feel like we can do better as a society and I think that we can do that by creating really enriching experiences for people um, that use technology as magic they don't make, um, you know, if you talk, you go and um, there's a great talk I saw a couple of years ago by Netflix and Uber and Google and they were all talking about um, titration. Um, so titration in the form of um, when you uh, pull somebody off and on a drug, essentially. Um, and th there's been a huge movement by um, uh, experience designers and interface designers uh, around uh, uh, um, collectivization and actually saying well, we need to uh, create a, a, a universal protocol and a universal law, uh, essentially, not law, <laughs> it be a law, but like a, a, a system of best practice yeah. so that we're not creating, um, you know, I'm from New South Wales, I see the damage that pokies do. I don't want one in my pocket and I don't want one with my kid walking around. So there's a whole bunch of these kind of things that are coming up for us in terms of and so it's like, that's why I do it. That's why I get up every day is because I think we can do better. I think we can do more um, with technology. I think we can be less harmful. So that's, that's for me. It's going to be different for Claire. It's going to be different for Tom. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I just don't want to, you know, I, I think it's going to be different for everyone that works with the team. It's only technology. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, mine's kind of a simple one. You've talked a lot about um, 
how diverse the people are at the company and that for like some of the extreme technology things you bring in contractors, what are, you say it's a multidisciplinary team, what are the backgrounds? What's the makeup of the team yeah. that we've got? Yeah, what kind of experiences and backgrounds do they come to your studio with? Um, we, uh, uh, we sometimes refer to them as agency refugees, so people that have been into ad land or have been into kind of the other parts of commercial creativity and they've come out of it and going, I just want to make stuff and I'm not making anything. All I'm doing is spending time sort of, you know, wasting my talent. Um, so we have a lot of those, um, a lot of those people doing that. Um, I think that there's a, um, it's a combination, you know, we've got, um, Mauricio from Brazil, who is started making by making um, flash ads for years, and he's now our chief software architect, and he he's able to architect entire systems um, that drive all. Of the, we just did um, this um, driver education experience centre at the TAC, and he designed the the software architecture. So, you know, in terms of where he was sort of 10, 15 years ago to where he is now, it's like. It's really by allowing people to kind of explore those things. We've got uh, designers. Uh, the actual team makeup is, is designers, project managers, <coughs> and producers, um, and um, and technologists. Um, some of them are more kind of come from more academic backgrounds. Like uh, Sam is a um, a mechanical engineer um, and um, uh, and an, ele uh, an electrical engineer. Um, and he's able to kind of build pretty complex physical technologies. Uh, uh, Tom, um, uh, who's our um, technical director, he has a master's in design and uh, a master's in engineering. And he's got uh, first class honours in both, so his like, brain is like split down the middle and sometimes you don't know who you're talking to. You're talking to the creative or you're talking to the technologist. But he kind of does a pretty good job. Um, uh, Claire, like, um, I think it's diversity in role as well. Like, so Claire's our managing director, but you probably won't find a, a more creative managing director. So sometimes she'll run, she'll run Creative Point on a project. In fact, Mad Hatters was her project. Um, so she made all of the creative decisions, and and you know, uh, you know, there wasn't uh, the the regular validation that you would have with a creative director, but there doesn't need to be either because the creative decisions that Claire's making are bang on, and and she's sort of helped that team and, and Acme to build a, a, a pretty incredible experience. So it's kind of, um, they're all backgrounds um, and um, yeah, it's, we, we, I think we've got like four or five people that have left in six years and you know, one's gone on to win Emmys over in uh, uh, the US, another has had a baby and then is hopefully, fingers crossed sort of today, about to uh, get a job at, at Lego over in Denmark. So they're kind of going on to do really great things and I'm really proud of our alumni. One came back, Mar Marcio, we can't get rid of him. He's, uh, we sent him away for a few years and then he's come back. And um, But uh, yeah, it's a pretty tight team. And um, uh, Does that answer your question? Sorry, I waffle. <laughs> um, cool, thank you for coming, guys. <coughs> Thanks, guys.